My name is Alberto Moreno and I'm from Durango, Mexico. This picture was taken of, of my mother and the four of us after my father had left. My father had been in the U.S. for about a year, so we haven't seen him in a year. And uh, we have no cameras in my village. We don't have a single picture of us together. This carnival of Romani came through our village of all places and they, they had toys and they had rides and they had a gentleman with the camera. And so my mother seized an opportunity uh, to find uh, some saved centavitos here and there to have a picture of us taken all together to send to Papa. She has cajoled us, uh, has tried to make us behave for the camera, but for some reason we're all very unhappy because she wants to get it perfect and we're not doing exactly what she needs, so she wants us to look our best and to look happy, and yet we're not happy, we're a little bit uh, miserable and and because uh, we haven't been able to buy toys at the fair and we don't have money for the rides. And so the, when the photographer snaps the picture, my mother is looking uh, quite fetching for my father. But we all, the rest of us, look a little bit uh, miserable uh, and unreconciled to say the least. My father had emigrated first and then a year and a half later he sent for my mother and two of the children. There were four of us. And so my mom had to make a very difficult decision about which of her two children she would bring with and which of her two children she would leave behind. And my mother started to cry and uh, my brothers started to cry, my sister started to cry and, and uh, to my surprise I heard this voice. Uh, I didn't know where it was coming from. And, and the voice was saying, Mama, yo me quedo. Mama, I'll stay behind. And uh, it was my voice. We moved to my uh, grandmother's village. And uh, both my sister and I ended up staying there for another year. So we waited for a year, which is a very long time for someone who's eight. But eventually my parents worked two jobs each uh, in Chicago. They saved enough money to pay for a coyote. The coyote was uh, a man and a woman, basically a husband and wife, who were also of Mexican descent, but they had been in the States for a long time. So they were fairly fair-skinned. We were very dark from working in the fields. It was going to be difficult to convince the the border agents that we were their children. So I remember they came upon a very novel solution, which was to buy us the masks for the luchadores and, and put them on us. And so there's this uh, very famous luchador in Mexico called Santo, and uh, that's who I was. And so I like to say that Santo was uh, my coyote and Santo crossed me over the border. It was a new world to us and we were very brown and very dark and spoke not a word of English. I remember being picked on a lot. I remember being in a lot of fist fights uh, because people would pick on us for being newly arrived. And so it was just, uh, it was just a process to, to be admitted into this country and into the grace of this country, which is something that I would say still hasn't happened. But it is true that every day, every new day, every new moment, every new situation, it feels to me that I have to fight for admission. And there's always that nine-year-old boy asking, what right do you have to be here? Um, and there's a kind of survivor's guilt that is always present around 
why, why you? Why do you get to be here when the people that you went to school with, the people that you left behind, when the rest of your community is not invited? I'm 50 and I still struggle with it, uh, having to travel through that border. Every time that I get close to that border or that I have to cross it, the, the nervousness, the, the apprehension, the fear that that uh, nine-year-old boy felt crossing the very first time reasserts itself. And to this day, I loathe that border. To this day, I'm afraid of it because it's so deeply connected with need. It's so deeply connected with being poor, so deeply connected with being hungry, so deeply connected with being homeless. And that is often tied to borders. That is often tied to rivers, which is why this place is always it's so alive for me and so important to be close to this river, to be close to a crossing, uh, to be under the shadow of this bridge that, that bridges two distinct places, that has a foot in each place. Which is the other thing about being an immigrant, is that you often have one foot in one place and another in another. And that kind of uh, akimbo displacement of your body creates some balance and uncertainty. But it also has the potential to create grace, to bridge between one place and another, between one culture and another, between one reality and another, between lack of understanding and fuller understanding. I am no longer just Mexican, or not simply uh, from El Norte. Sometimes that can feel lonely. Sometimes you don't fit in either place. Sometimes you're a stranger in your own language, which you don't inhabit fully anymore, while feeling like a stranger at home. It is that always that other journeying and never feeling like you've arrived. I'm Mexicano. Uh, I was born in Mexico. I'm not Chicano. I'm not second generation. I'm not even first generation, I don't think. I am what comes before that. I'm the antecedent of that. But for a long time, I literally had taken on somebody else's label for me. And for a very long time, my primary identification in this country was as illegal. That has shifted for me, continues to shift. That's how I was defined by others, and I actually unknowingly had accepted that definition of self. So my name is Salome Chimuku. My parents immigrated here from Angola. When the Civil War broke out in the 70s, my father fled because he had ties and connection to the Rebel Party. And my mother fled because her father was a Protestant minister in a Catholic country. They ended up accidentally crossing the border between Zambia and Angola. My parents found themselves in a foreign country, in a refugee camp, and 17 years later, ended up having five children inside that refugee camp. Even if you're born in Zambia on the refugee camp, you're not considered a citizen. And so my brothers were basically citizens of nowhere, um, having been born there and they wouldn't allow people to leave the camp unless you were sponsored out of the country. Okay. 
It was a pretty average refugee camp for African standards. People didn't have enough food, and so my dad did a whole like irrigation track and like really have like a community farm. And um, they try to do things like pool their money together to be able to buy cattle and like goats and chickens and livestock. My grandparents were the only doctors on the refugee camp, so a lot of people went to them when they had children or were sick and need assistance, and so they kind of all just took care of each other and made it work. Because of that, I have relatives or people that I call cousins or aunts and uncles that are from different African countries uh, than myself, um, who uh, spent those 17 years with my parents in that refugee camp. In the late 80s, early 90s, my family was sponsored in parts. My grandparents got sponsored by Ainsworth United Church of Christ, which is in Northeast Portland. And my parents were sponsored by uh, a Mormon church in Florida. <laughs> and so my mother's parents ended up coming here to Portland, Oregon, and my parents ended up in uh, Florida. <laughs> Along the way from Florida to Oregon, they traveled by Greyhound bus. One of my brothers ended up sick and they ended up losing all of their documentations when one of their bags was stolen. After being in Portland for a short while, maybe a couple weeks, my mom gave birth to me at OHSU. Her experience with having children was she had some of my brothers at home by herself and in some cases my grandmother was there to help her. She felt completely disoriented. She felt like she was over-medicated. Everyone was trying to tell her that there was something wrong, but she didn't feel like there was something wrong. So a week later, when she finally went to labor with me, she says it was the longest labor she ever had. And halfway through, the doctors were saying that they had to do an emergency C-section or else I would end up killing her and myself because <laughs> I was too big. Gave her some anesthesia to put her out and halfway through the needle injection, I came flying out, <laughs> right at the surgical doors. <laughs> All she could say was like, hallelujah, and then she fell asleep. <laughs> that's how my family came here, and that's how I was born shortly after. And for a long time, my parents lived in Northeast in a housing apartment and my grandparents lived in the attic of the church for a few years. It was just very apparent that it was very heavy about assimilation, and so when people gave us things, it was just very hard to take, honestly, for me at least as a kid, just because I didn't see my parents and my family the way that I think other people saw them. And I think for a long time, I always had in my brain that if I so much as accepted these gifts from other people, then I was accepting their view of my family. I mean, I feel like when you give somebody something, you're giving somebody something and it automatically makes them vulnerable. And I think that when you're not acknowledging that vulnerability, it comes off as condescending. So my parents oftentimes would try to save as much as they can to buy us birthday gifts and try to make us feel like we were ordinary children. And I grew up in this same neighborhood. It looks a lot different now because it's been remodeled, but um, this was all low income housing um, that was subsidized. And so everyone in the neighborhood was poor. And I think that a lot of the parents were doing the same thing, especially the immigrant parents was trying to make their children not feel like they were poor. <laughs> um, and it worked for the most part. I, as I got older, I just thought everybody had parents that worked all the time and didn't really go on many vacations, and this was a way of life, and I thought everybody was immigrants or black <laughs> until I started to go to school elsewhere, and I was like, where did all these white people come from? <laughs> like, where have they been all this time? And that hurt in terms of getting help, because in my childhood growing up, a lot of the people that helped were like these white families, and so 
as a, at a young age, I was already starting to associate wealth with whiteness. It's interesting because um, being in the U.S. and not having an accent, um, when people find out that my family's from another place or that I'm from another place, they often say like, oh, I thought you were just regular black. And I'm just like, I don't know what regular black is. Like all of us came from, if you're black, you came from the same, we all came from the same spot. You didn't pick your black people from the moon. Like, they came from Africa. <laughs> and it's just like, look, these other people can't tell us apart, and they're gonna treat us the same way because of the color of our skin. So whether you're Haitian, whether you're Angolan, whether you're African American, whether you're European black, they're gonna look at us to see black, and they're gonna treat us however they wanna treat black people, regardless of our income level, regardless of what country we're from. They just see black and they're gonna treat us the same. So we might as well treat each other the same and try to figure out, you know, what we wanna change in our lives. This photo was taken um, when I was under a year old. My mother loved dressing me in these white frilly dresses. There's a white bonnet that goes with this dress that I'm supposed to be wearing, but I kept ripping it off before the photographer could take the photo. And um, at this point, my mother had gotten so frustrated. So she's actually mad, but she's smiling. And that's what made my brother Peter start laughing really hard. And he was trying to like not do the open mouth laugh. It was kind of funny because my family always looked kind of dated. When I was a kid, a lot of people talked about how my family looks like f certain famous like African American actors and actresses. My name is Casey Chama, and I'm originally from Somalia. Well, um, my country um, went through a very, very difficult uh, civil war. I graduated in you know, high school, and I think I was probably the last group uh, that graduated high school before the whole country collapsed. I think many youth in my country had uh, very few options either join the fighting um, or um, leave the country. And I decided uh, to leave the country. You know, when you, you leave your country and you really, you don't know what to expect. The refugee experience that you, you stay one place, you come to one place, and then you figure it out uh, where to go next. So uh, through that process, you know, I end up, you know, very uh, many places in, uh, I think probably, you know, from 60 different countries. Then where is home? <laughs> That's the question. I end up in 1998 in Portland, Oregon. And I really liked it a lot, uh, just because of the beauty and the nature and the, it's very calm. And um, yes, uh, it's a, it was a long journey coming here. There's a three stages in my life that really fundamentally impacted me and made me shape who I am as a human being, as a person uh, in this world. Uh, my first eight or nine years uh, of my life, I grew up as a nomad child in uh, Somalia. My family was a nomad family. Um, every morning, 
Um, you wake up six in the morning, uh, my mom makes breakfast, uh, and then milks the, the goat and uh, all the livestock that we have. And then by 7, 7, 30 in the morning, everyone has a job to do it. So if, if you're a small kid, you take care of the baby uh, goats and uh, small animals. They don't come back until the evening. I remember, I always stay in the center of the livestock. I always believe that that's the safest place to be. Uh, because if a hyena comes and you, know, you can grab a, a, a sheep or goat on the uh, corner, but you don't want to be on the corner. <laughs> you, so the safest place to be, at, so then I used to play around that in the middle of the, of the livestock. But also it taught me that, you know, you depend on the environment that you live in and you uh, try to make it work for you. Uh, um, but also you have a lot of respect for the environment because um, yeah, it, you, your life depends on. The second stage is then, you know, when I left the nomad uh, life and then I went to the big city in Mogadishu, which is the, you know, Somali capital. It's a big city of, you know, at that time, one and a half million people. Um, and I remember, I vividly remember the night that we arrived. I think it was about, I think it might be 10 o'clock at night. I was so mesmerized. The lights, the bridges, the, it's just, it, it's just like I have never seen anything like that. It was just completely mesmerizing experience, just a child, and I was completely like blown away. Then, you know, coming and starting schooling in big city, and the first day when I went to enroll in school, first grader, I knew at the, the, just the minute I arrived that I'm the outsider, I'm like, I'm not in the group. Um, so, of course, then what I learned from the nomad life experience as a child was always adapt to your environment. There's a 15 minutes gap where the teachers have to go from one classroom to another classroom. And that 15 minutes usually with the school principal does, they appoint a head student in the classrooms to keep the things in place and make sure that there is no, uh, you know, the classes stay quiet, be quiet, make sure that nobody does something stupid or crazy. So um, I decided I want to I wanna be the head uh, master in the class because uh, then I, I, I'm, I'm in charge. So that's how I survived. And then the third stage in my life is um, being a refugee and outside of Somalia. And then coming to uh, Portland, you know, one of the uh, widest cities in, in, in America and really um, trying to also uh, adapt to, uh, to become a new, uh, new American. I think immigrants and refugees are one of the most resilient people in this world. When you are a refugee, in many ways, it wasn't your choice uh, to leave. You are forced to leave, uh, to leave your country and your uh, environment and your neighborhood. Refugees, wherever they go, uh, create an opportunity uh, for themselves and the new community that they became part of it. It makes me sad to see people who are right now, how this country became so anti-immigrant and anti-refugee. So this picture with my niece and my older brother um, and myself. All three of us actually traveled together coming to uh, Mogadishu. It was, I believe, the first picture ever taken from me. So it was a kind of a new beginning, being from a nomad kid to be a now uh, a city boy. I think as a kid, you're absorbing 
everything that you have seen and experienced. So I remember you had to go to the photo studio to take the, the picture. You make an appointment, you, you make sure that you dress up. It's a very unique moment. I was really excited. Really, someone is gonna take a picture and then it suddenly will be me. And then, of course, when you go to the studio, they have the pictures of other people that they have taken. I remember just going to the Photoshop and just mesmerized about all the pictures around the studio. And I couldn't stop looking at it. They will tell you, oh, you know, today's you know, Monday, you have to come back for your picture next week on, on Friday. So you're really counting every single day, every single minute. This is a very, very uh, powerful picture. Every time that you look, it's almost like, you know, you're going to a funnel of memories. And because that life that I had in Mogadishu when I was growing up, it represents that moment of my life. But it also it represents transitional time. So when I look at it, I'm looking my, in many cases, my entire life. I'm really grateful that I have this picture in my hand because, you know, when things really become a challenging and tough, and I look at the picture and I say, look how far I can. Um, so the question was, is how did we all find each other? Um, I met Alberto while working at the Capitol building, and uh, I was in college at the time working as a um, legislative assistant for the Democratic Caucus of the Senate. And I remember meeting Alberto in a way that was kind of funny. Um, I was not exactly the most pristine at that moment because I was eating. <laughs> And our office was short-handed, and um, I remember meeting him, and it was a very fun experience for me because I often don't have my name pronounced correctly when I tell folks my name, and most of the time when someone pronounces it correctly, I'm like, either you're really into music, you're super religious, or you speak Spanish or French. <laughs> and so that was kind of when I met Albert, so it was there, and um, it was kind of interesting because I was supposed to take him back to meet um, one of the policy advisors, and he was like, oh, he's like, this is really great. He's like, Are you, do you go to the university across the street? And I said, yes. And I'm pretty certain he assumed I'm at the law school and not the undergrad school. <laughs> and so when, I, uh, when he was like, oh, um, He's like, oh, this is a this is a great opportunity, and I was like, yeah, no, I'm really surprised he gave me a job. And he's like, wait, you're an employee? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm surprised too, man. <laughs> and that was our first kind of encounter, um, which was, I think, a very fun point in my life to get to meet somebody that would become a comrade and a good friend. So that's how I met this gentleman. I met Irene through my work at what is now Unite Oregon, um, which formerly was the Center for Intercultural Organizing. And um, a very similar experience. I kind of made a fool of myself like I do when I meet most of my good friends. Um, and it just kind of blossomed from there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I, had, I had no idea who she was, but she was very beautiful and I took some pictures of her. And when I was uh, doing this project, I knew that I wanted her from the pictures, but I didn't know her name. <laughs> so <laughs> so I uh, figured it out, and then I got in touch with her, and I asked her, you know, do you want to be in this project? And I was afraid she's going to say no. I said yes. And the same thing with Alberto. Alberto I met, actually he was on Facebook or something, and he, I liked his posts because he's a poet. 
So I decided, you know, he must be very good for this project because he's so articulate and as you could hear that he speaks beautiful anything, any, every language that he speaks must be like, yeah. So I asked him on Facebook, on Messenger, you know, Alberta, do you want to do this? And in the beginning he was hesitant, so I had to court him for <laughs> quite a long time. And uh, yeah, and uh, finally he had to give up because I think I was very pushy. <laughs> you were very persistent. I was persistent, yes, exactly. I was easy. <laughs> I used to be easy. <laughs> I <wasn't anymore. laughs> so what made you start this project and what is your goal? Um, <clears throat> I thought about this project in connection with photographs in the beginning. And uh, I was always interested in uh, immigrants and refugees. Obviously, you can tell that I am one myself. So um, I always really liked very much vernacular photography, you know, like when people show you pictures from back home. And in the same time, I wanted to bring some stories of immigrants and refugees in order to show, you know, that there is a lot behind the exterior and actually these people have amazing adventures in their lives and we don't know because we never really ask them. And uh, yeah, they have very adventurous lives. They travel, they, they live in many countries, many uh, cultures, they speak more than one language, they can deal in, you know, in this culture and in that culture, so they are extremely interesting people. So this combination between my interest in vernacular photography, so I, each one of them is talking about an image or a photograph. There are eight pieces. Today we showed three of them. There is a website. Um, where you can see the rest of them. And I guess maybe that answers the question. I don't know. Um, what was uh, the technique that you used? Was it the same as far as uh, for the photographs and the animation? Um, I, I like very much found images. And uh, I go on, on the internet and I make searches for all kind of bizarre things and you know if there are if there are things that uh, I'm going to modify a lot I don't really care so much about the copyright if I use them the way they are I look for creative common copyright and uh, I I use them as a collage together with some art that I make myself like and um, also, I cut out the photographs in the same way, and I, I, I use After Effects for it. It's cool, like a really cool look. Yeah? yeah? Thank you. Appreciate it. You had a question? Yeah, I was wondering if you'd be uh, willing to talk a little bit about your background and your story of coming to America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, so I was born and raised in a communist country in Romania. And at the age of 17, uh, we emigrated to Israel. My family is Jewish. I, um, at the time, Romania was kind of like North Korea today. And um, People really wanted to get out of there. It was a dream. Everybody wanted to get out because they couldn't. Uh, Jews were lucky because now and again, the Americans would pay some money to the Romanian government who was very hungry for dollars. And they would pay, I don't know, $5,000, I heard. I'm not sure, per person. And they would let, I don't know, a couple of thousand, I don't know, a few thousand people go. So that's how we got out of Romania. And um, it was a two and a half hour flight from Bucharest to Tel Aviv, from North Korea to the free world. 
Um, I was completely elated. I mean, it was a dream of my life. That's it. I was going to America, and I'm going to, you know, rock and roll and do all those things. Um, all the adults in the flight stood in one line to the toilet. There was no one sitting down. People were standing in line to go to the toilet for two and a half hours. These people stood in line and went to the toilet one after the other because they were terrified. And uh, I mean, because they were adults and they understood that this is not going to be easy. So that's how I started. And then uh, I lived in Europe and uh, European countries for a little while. And then I came to America and I lived in LA. And then I went back to Israel and to Europe, eh, back and forth, kind of. And uh, came to Portland about 20 years ago with my husband and two children and raised them here in Portland. And uh, it became my home. Thank you. You're welcome. I was going to ask if you all feel like Portland is home. The question was, do we feel like Portland is home? I remember they told us to repeat it. Um, <laughs> ooh, y'all can go ahead first on that one. Yeah, <laughs> Alberto. I was just here to repeat that Alberto question. Alberto, <laughs> is home? The question is if Portland feels like home or is home. There are rare moments when it does, uh, but often I, I think, as you heard from the video, we, there's a kind of uh, of dissonance between the the place that we occupy as immigrants and the place that you occupy. Even when we're physically in the same space that you are occupying, we inhabit a different space as refugees, as immigrants, as people of color. And so the experience that you're having at Papa Haydn is never the same experience that we as immigrants are having at Papa Haydn. The experience that you're having walking down Alberta Street is never the same experience that we have walking down Alberta Street. The experience that we have when we walk into a Macy's uh, where we're followed by security is not the same experience that you have. And so there are times when this place is welcoming. Those moments are f few and far between. And those moments feel like home. But th th that place of home is a moment. It's a sort of a, a cursory place, if you will. Um, I, mean, I guess for me to answer that question, um, I would I'd have to compare it to uh, language that I use to describe or try to bring life to my complex PTSD. I wouldn't consider it home, I'd consider it the familiar. It's the place that I know, it's the place where I know what to expect, but doesn't necessarily mean that I have all of the feelings that a home should bring to this place. Um, and it is, I guess in a swaying way of this idea of being familiar with something and knowing to expect, but not necessarily expecting good. <laughs> um, and it's stable, and as a person who loves stability, it's stable, I know what to expect, but it doesn't necessarily mean that what I'm expecting is nice or that I like it. Um, and it's kind of strange because Portland is a place that I've spent most of my time, um, most of my adolescence, and um, in a very insular bubble that doesn't exist in Portland anymore. <laughs> and it is, I guess, what I would call the familiar. I would hesitate to call it home. I'd hesitate to call any place home um, other than the physical house in which my parents and siblings dwell. Um, but I would definitely call it the familiar. Yeah, I mean, what is, a, what is home, you know? Yeah. My question is, you know, you're saying, you know, going to Papa Haydn's, for example, is different, you know, than other people, you know, right here at home. Cool. But I would just like to tell me, is it over time, is it getting better, that feeling, you know, that is not like, let, let's say, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you know, is that getting any better, that feeling when 
you enter and think, you know, I'm not at home, I don't feel like what you really meant when you said, you know, walking down the street or whatever. I, I, I'm just not sure. Is that feeling getting any better, easier? You're getting more familiar with that place and you feel better over the time and you're going forward. You know, I, the, I, I, I don't know if I, if I do. The, there's a part of me that feels pulled to, to say to you, yes, it's, it's getting better. There's a part of me that feels that you're asking me to say, absolutely, every day is better, every year is better. But I, I don't want to lie to you. I, I, I don't want to be disingenuous to, to my experience or to the experience of people of color in the city, which is, uh, and I'm being kind, which is very dissonant. Uh, I mean, I, I tell a story where I was walking down Alberta and sat down outside of a Mexican restaurant, and the next thing I know is a white couple is asking me to move so they can sit their dog at the table that I was seated at. Right, and and they became angry because I didn't want to move so they could accommodate their dog, and so I, I want to give you that sort of happy story that you're craving. I want to give you the sort of that that narrative of of benevolent whiteness, but I can't give that to you because it it doesn't exist in my experience. Now that said, there are really kind people. There are kind people who have also stood for us. Uh, when you and I met, we were uh, working, I was working uh, at the Capitol at lobbying for what has now become law, which is cover all kids. Uh, we were successful in passing a law that ensures that all children, regardless of documentation, have access to the state's Medicaid plan. And, and when I'm walking down the Capitol, when I see somebody like you or somebody like me, it is a strange moment because that's not who we're accustomed to seeing down those corridors. That's not who legislators are accustomed to seeing down the, the hallway. And yet there are unexpected places where we find kindness, that where we weren't expecting it, where we find a kind of irrational kindness. And, and that's, I have to tell you, and I'm kind of, the more I think about it, I'm grateful for your question because those are sort of the rendering moments for me. When you find this unexpected kindness that has no precedent in the environment, right? So to have the governor stand for these 20,000 kids to, to say, we will do this. To, to have legislators like Representative Kenny Geyer say, this is the right thing to do, to have even Republicans uh, who faced certain censure after supporting undocumented children and prenatal care for undocumented women. To, to, to see that is just restorative. And so those are the moments that I refer to. The, but I, I walk in really privileged circles now. That wasn't always the case, as you saw, but I, I really walk in these really privileged places. And, and, and what I want to do, what we want to do, I think, is we want to create that sort of safe space for all of our communities so that no one gets asked to move so they could accommodate their infantilized, infantilized dog at a table, right? Uh, where, where we where we don't sort of make this 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 call that a dog's place in the world is more important than a Mexican's place in the world. Yeah. Marianne, can you speak to being someone who people probably identify as white, although you also identify yourself as someone not from here? And mm. Oh yeah, I mean. Definitely, my experience has, you know, is nothing like that. Uh, at some point in my life, I was in LA. I was very young, and I was I had a student visa, and then I lost it. So I was undocumented for four years. I lived in Los Angeles at the time. There were huge ice raids in the manufacturers, the textile manufacturer in the East LA that was all Mexican. And the, the ice will come and will hunt people like, 
you hunt animals, you know. And the, 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 the women that were working there, majority of them were women, were running away. And they were, like, running after them and catching them like, you know, like you catch wild horses. And I, I was in L.A. for four years, and I worked, and I paid taxes, and nobody ever asked me anything, you know. And I was undocumented, like, just like they were, you know. I mean, not even once and I do have an accent, not even once did anyone come to me, and yeah, it was awful, you go to immigration, they trick you like shit and stuff, but, but it's nothing like that, you know? Definitely, being white is a different, a different world altogether. Peridina, I, I want to say how much I appreciate that you're using that, that sort of unmarked, unregistered white privilege to elevate other voices. That, that's something altogether different. And, and often white folks think that we want them to feel guilty about their white privilege. And there's no utility in, in, in guilt. Right. We, we're not vested in you feeling guilty. It doesn't get what, you a No, it doesn't get you a paycheck. <laughs> What's more importantly, it doesn't get you a paycheck, yes. <laughs> Uh, w but what's really important, and maybe what there is some expectation of, is, is, is that it be used in service to elevate others, which I really appreciate that you're doing, so thank you. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, I think that um, as an experience for me, this project was very pleasant because I get to listen to all those amazing stories and be part of, you know, for, for a second, be part of uh, families or people or stories that usually, you know, in my white world, I don't get to be there. And I know it's a big problem, but, you know, I mean, for me, it was wonderful. I felt a guest in all kind of worlds that otherwise I am completely separated from. And uh, honestly, I don't know how to bring all these worlds together or what should I do, but yeah, so. It's actually pretty funny because a few days after she came to film me, she met my father and my nephew by happenstance at the same park. And it was just like, <laughs> this a really funny thing. So he's like, oh yeah, I did this like video project. And I was like, oh yeah, I know, I met the lady. I was like, oh, well, I, I. <laughs> yeah, and it was, it was, yeah, it was, it, it was in the park that they filmed. And it was really funny, because uh, uh, growing up as a kid, um, we had this like kind of saying that all of the African dads know each other and they all talk to each other, because that's how small the African community in Portland was for the longest time. And so as I was like kind of stunned, like, Oh, you met her? And he goes, yeah, she was in the park and your nephew came running through her to say, be like, take my picture, take my picture. And I was like, don't bother that lady. She's not from here. Like, <laughs> 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 and then she told me, um, she was telling us what she was doing. And then she asked our name. And of course, your nephew, he just gives her his whole name. Oh, I'm, I'm Robert Chimuku. She goes, Chimuku, I know that name. And he said, my heart kind of dropped because I was like, please, not any of the sons. <laughs> <laughs> any of the sons. And so when she said that she had talked to you and filmed you about our story, I said, oh, that's great. That's awesome. And we talked and it was great. And then I was like, I'm really kind of surprised you met her by happenstance. And my brother comes walking by. He's like, you know, this African dad network, like you just can't walk around the neighborhood and they don't see you and don't figure out who you are. I was like, I guess so. This is how they get all their information is serendipitously meeting people on the street and starting conversation. Yeah. Actually, uh, your father um, had this, your father is like a politics, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Everyone know about any he has, random culture, he knows any random place. Any possible. I mean, <laughs> so I'm having a conversation with Mr. Chimuku about Ceausescu, who was the dictator in Romania at the time that I was a child. And this man knows more about Ceausescu than I do, <laughs> you know. So, so it was quite interesting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, oh, what's, next for you? what's next for me? 
wine. <laughs> how's, that, how's that for an answer? She's a very practical woman. I mean, tomorrow's never promised. Yeah. About that. It's true. You know, Especially I we we have I <laughs> um I don't know Stephanie is here. Stephanie is started to work or maybe she ran away. She started to work for a national uh, refugee organization and if you would like to say a few words about refugees because you know no, we don't know much about refugees. I think. And I don't know. You okay. don't know much about refugees no. either? Oh, well. <laughs> why they hire you? Weird. Um, <laughs> why did they hire you? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm Stephanie. My husband was Casey Jama, the third third person in the series who is in Medford today and couldn't be here. Um, and I'm here with my kids, so they're a little. Um, but yeah, this. I, first I just want to say thank you to you um, the folks who, and I think maybe there are some folks who are here that were also in some other videos. Um, it's extremely intimate to share that kind of, that kind of um, internal lens, I guess, um, and stories about your families. Um, I know for Casey it was really hard. And I've known you both for a long time, and I know you as you know, kick-ass organizers and, and amazing um, community leaders. And I feel like this is a part of you that's kind of opened up to share with all of us. And, and it's just extremely intimate. And I'm very thankful for that. And also, Arena, for your, your ability to sort of tell the story of, um, I can't speak to your experience, but what I see in my husband, um, I almost think of him as like a little prince on his own planet. Because, you know, he talked a lot about adapting here, adapting here, adapting here. And I had the chance to go to Somalia with him in 2007, before kids. And um, it was so interesting because you could see the same cognitive dissonance um, going back to Somalia. But it probably took 48 hours. And he completely changed into a different person. I mean, he, the way his manners, his thought process, the way he talked to people feeling home in his own skin again, the way that he related to me, everything changed. And so to live in both worlds and nowhere, you know, at the same time, is almost like being your, in your own world that nobody else is ever really a part of. Um, it's so important for me as somebody who works with and alongside of folks like you to remember that at all times. You know, it is different at Papa Hayden <laughs> and elsewhere. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just now I'm um, helping stand up a national campaign that's called We Are All America, um, because we are. <laughs> um, that's a story we tell ourselves. And uh, this, this campaign is essentially to work organizing um, support, the latent support that's out there, I think, for refugees and newcomers in the United States um, to fight back against a lot of the nationalism, especially white nationalism, that's that's happening in the country now. Um, things like the Muslim ban, things like um, what's DACA being used as a political football. Um, so I guess there's a connection there, but as I go and do this work, I think I'm going to be thinking of those videos and sharing those videos um, and using them in trainings <laughs> with people who look like me and have no accent um, about what that's like. So thank you for, for sharing. It's actually funny that Stephanie uh, brought up her work. Uh, right now, I work for the state um, implementing what is Oregon's and Profiling Act. And so I definitely had a different experience considering my last job was working alongside Stephanie and Casey at a nonprofit that focused on immigrant and refugee rights to working in a space that was has been definitely very uninviting <laughs> and kind of feeling like oh this is a uh, hmm uh, I want to go home <laughs> uh, and it's it's very strange because when I first walked into the work I I felt like my everyday experience was going to be having 
more um, macro like conversations about bias and about other things of that nature. To whereas now I feel like my job is way more rudimentary and I feel like I'm talking to my nephews and being like, no, you can't touch people there. No, <laughs> not, not cool, not okay. Uh, I, I don't know why I'm telling an adult this, but knock it off. <laughs> I don't, I don't like it. They don't like it. We all kind of don't like it. Just cut it out. Um, which, in a essence, has also, I think, kind of built a very interesting relationship with my father. Uh, one of the things that I didn't really talk about much was uh, it's very strange, in a way, to be an African immigrant to the United States uh, because exterior-wise, before I open my mouth, there's the assumption that it's African-American. And I found that when my folks first moved here, uh, both of my parents found a makeshift community in the Latino community as well as the African American community. One, because they both could speak Portuguese and Spanish, so that was the tie to the Latino community. And a lot of the work they did was alongside of other Latinos, so my dad picked oranges in Florida for, uh, before coming to Oregon. Um, which he almost lost his hand to a machine. Um, to whereas my mother, um, you know, albeit her degrees, ended up, you know, being a home care provider. <laughs> um, and it was a very interesting time because I remember this as a kid, but it didn't really settle much until an adulthood. Uh, the amount of times that I remember us being pulled over late at night when my dad would take me to work with him. And like instances where the garbage bags that he was trying to throw away were ripped open um, to look for anything and everything, and then spending hours cleaning up afterwards and getting home super late because of it. And again, I just kind of grew up thinking that was a norm. And the people around me, being that they were you know, other immigrants, mostly Latino immigrants, as well as African immigrants and African Americans, that was our norm. So I didn't think anything of it until I started going elsewhere in high school. And now in my job, it's kind of this interesting uh, connection that I have with certain folks who come and file complaints is this experience of being able to say like, oh yeah, I, I, I know how that goes. I could probably tell you your whole experience without you having to tell me much of anything. Yeah, I could tell you what they probably said too. And as time went on, um, being in an essence of having this weird, awkward moment, I remember at work once, where I just had this like pitfall into my stomach where I realized that I would never feel comfortable asking my dad to come and work with me, which was very different than my experience with previous work. Um, I worked in the Capitol for most of those years and then worked at CIO, and so my father has kind of always come with me to work. I always drag him out, um, as well as my mother. And they do this whole super immigrant spiel, I call it, which is they get all fancy dressed, overly dressed for the situation. They're shaking everyone's hands. They kind of look like diplomats. <laughs> and <laughs> it's a very fun experience for them. And it was kind of interesting because I, I remember speaking to my father about it. And I was like, I feel really bad because I feel like I should be able to invite you and want to invite you, but I don't. And he just kind of laughed and shrugged. And he was like, yeah, I know, and I don't want to go either. <laughs> it's like, it's like, this kind of sucks. And he um, made me kind of laugh, and he was like, well, you know, I can go. It's no problem. Your mom, though, she can't go. She's a princess. She, to your, her parents were doctors. She's, she's too bubbled in. Like, she, she can't deal with that. I could go, but, you know, I might have to leave the country the next day. That's all I'll say to that. And I was like, it was just kind of this weird feeling of, this identity of here is my father and I, I don't know if you were able to make it out from the picture but he does have this thousand yard stare that my friends call um, that I feel like is definitely the face of a child soldier and that's what he was and so I, I always have this pinging feeling with him especially in the current climate about like what happens if he gets pulled over what happens is because of his accent the officer can't understand what he's saying what happens if they misinterpret his face? My face gets misinterpreted as hostile all the time, unless I'm <laughs> laughing. And it's just kind of this feeling of like, this is like a man who I often forget, probably can definitely handle his own to an American cop, <laughs> if it really came down to it. But it's still this feeling of, 
I guess that connection of not only him being an immigrant, but him also being a black man in America and understanding that because of the fact that he's black, that's what they see first. And then once the immigration status and you know his status in the US gets brought into play, it opens the door to how much more can happen to him. And just understand that he's that much more vulnerable because he's that seen as so physically threatening. Um, it's kind of this weird, I guess, place that I sit oftentimes with my family and their immigration experience. Because I have all brothers and most of them are six foot plus. So my experience on a daily is just like, okay, yeah, they're black men in America, but they're also black immigrant men in America. So uh, I don't really like them out of my sight. <laughs> Not that I could do much about it. I'm in the same boat as them, but it's definitely something I feel like is very true for our experience here is, you know, the whole, not only are you immigrant, but you're also black, which gives you extra attention, especially here in the Pacific Northwest. You know, what was really interesting for me is the, as you were describing that experience of wanting to protect your father and your brothers, you remind me that often uh, the women in our communities carry sort of a, uh, an unspoken task of taking care uh, of creating safe spaces for their men in this country. And it's kind of an unspoken, unseen act, but uh, the women from our communities are always brokering safety for us in these environments. And um, you just reminded me of that, because we don't ever talk about it. Uh, we always, I think as parents, think that we're taking care of our children and that's our job and, and then we forget that actually children also try to take care of their parents. And, and in this instance, uh, it is always women who are trying to broker safety for our immigrant men in, in really unsafe spaces. So thank you for reminding us of that. And, and I'm sorry that you have to carry that burden or your knucklehead brothers and your dad. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't met your brother, so. Oh, trust me, it's like watching an old episode of Fat Albert, it's just, <laughs> I swear. <laughs> um, I think one thing that's interesting is, um, I don't know if you've had this much about though, is like, especially when you're in a situation where you're spending the most time in your family as the being in the United States, and there's kind of this expectation of, all right, if anybody comes to the house, you, child, who's practically <laughs> grown up here, you speak first. Go in front, talk. Uh, I don't understand this, what does this mean? And now as an adult, it's kind of funny because I've never gone to law school. But to this day, my parents, if anybody comes to their door with any sort of legal trouble, they're like, oh, call our daughter. She'll definitely help you. I'm like, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I, I'm not even close. Um, I, I got some resources I can like shift you to. <laughs> I can try to read this document for you and tell you what I understand of it, but I'm not a lawyer. And I've noticed that that's the kind of a similar experience I've had with a lot of my friends who also identify as first generation or also immigrant who are the youngest in their families and kind of this expectation of you who is probably best at assimilating, do that <laughs> to help the family move forward with whatever we're trying to do mm -hmm. because you're our best bet. Because you're the youngest, which means that you have most of the doors open to you, regardless of the fact that you're also an immigrant. But you're doing better than us, who have had less time to adapt. So you, chameleon yourself and the rest of the family with you. <laughs> Go. <laughs> yeah, en English as a cape. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Learning all those fun things at ESL, like, I'm doing well. And the kid's like, we don't talk like that. It's like, I was told you did. <laughs> <laughs> I was forced to learn that you did. Okay. Any other questions? Do you ever feel like there's stuff that you have to kind of reconcile with parents? parents in terms Ooh, of like how, Jesus. Yeah, like how they experience race here. Uh, so the question was, is, uh, do we feel like we have to reconcile uh, issues of race and other things with our parents? You can go. I'm, I, I, I'm going to let you go first. 
try to repeat the question so I can get out of going first. Um, so with my parents, it's very interesting uh, for them, especially coming from a place where, you know, you still have a lot of racism, a lot of uh, different class issues due connect closely connected with color, um, and a lot of still white privilege. That is no way to describe besides colonial. Um, in my experience going to Angola last year, like the entire freaking restaurant stops when a white person walks in and like everybody moves and like it feels like this white person gets the entire restaurant to themselves because everyone's expected to move or get outside or just not be in the same room. Um, and then I think for them coming here, uh, my dad uh, never went to school. Uh, he is uh, very knowledgeable. Uh, but not academically educated in the traditional sense. And so he kind of knew what to expect coming to the United States because he was super into uh, the Panthers, a lot of the Pan-Africanism. That's hence why he had the, the mustache and the hair and the you know polyester suits. Um, Jesus. Uh, but it was, it was still kind of hard for them coming here. Uh, especially my mother, who grew up very sheltered and very privileged uh, for a lot of the folks coming from Angola. And reconciling race was a very hard f thing for them because over there, the biggest sort of mantra is that if we all band together, there's more of us than them and we can be okay and take back what is ours. To whereas over here, it's like, you could count every man, woman, child, dog in the African American <laughs> community and there is not enough to kind of overcome the system that is here and how the system here is similarly designed as over there, but is doing way better because there's more white people to keep it going. And so it was difficult for him in that sense. Um, he also did feel uh, a bit of uh, distance from some of the African American folks when he first came solely because they treated him like he was African and not black, similar to a lot of the white Americans he approached that were like, oh, well, you're African, you're different than the African Americans. And he's like, how? You just, you just didn't have enough room on your ship for me. Like, I'd have been just with them at the same time if, you know, fate was different. Um, and I think that reconciliation is kind of uh, hard. And I think in current climate, um, they've adapted very well uh, to survival and surviving here, uh, but they have the same fears that any other black parent has here in the United States, especially since they have a majority of sons. Um, and I think it's also slightly different. Um, they still have what I'd call kind of like Angolan fears. So when I told them I was taking this job, they're like, oh my God, you're gonna get yourself killed. What if a coup happens? You're gonna <laughs> die. Oh my God, what have we done? Child, you're like walking into the lion's <laughs> mouth. Well, oh my God, you're so American. Like you just don't understand how much da danger and you're just so American. You just, you just don't even have a concept of danger. Um, but <laughs> we've kind of had to talk about it and in the end, it always ends up the same. My father just kind of sighs and he's like, yep, yeah, you're right. You're right, Anita. She's mine. She's definitely my kid. <laughs> She's just running out here just Starting coups at a young age, just what I expect from my own seed. <laughs> I don't know if I can follow it or if I even need to follow that. <laughs> my mom did, though, uh, try very hard to bridge uh, sort of these gaps that she felt between her and her uh, Spanish-speaking colleagues. Um, all of my brothers have very translatable European names, except for me. And so I was kind of this funny thing where my mom would kind of lie. So when folks who especially um, were from Mexico would be like, oh, your daughter's name is Salome? Like the telenovela, right? And she goes, yeah, I named her after that woman. It's like, <laughs> no, you didn't. No, no, you, no, you didn't, but OK, sure. And <laughs> it was kind of like this, like, yes, friends. There's not enough Angolans here. All of all of the immigrant friends. There's only five Angolans here. Let's, let's, <laughs> we need friends because <laughs> there's not enough of us, which is where they came from. And my experience going back to Angola was mind blowing in the sense that 
again it was the cl- the racism was very colonial feeling and very like rooted but it's also very different walking into a store and knowing that majority of the products especially beauty products were meant for people that look like me i was like a kid in a candy store and i'm like look at all of this oh my i don't even want to buy it i just want to i just want to hold it for a second that i'm in a random store and everything in here is mostly made for me. Yeah, sure, there's like this luxurious, like golden shelf with all the white people products, but that's just one shelf. Like, the rest of this <laughs> store is mine. Like, this is amazing. Do I have, can I take this store back to Portland with me? Like, I don't really want to go anymore. An hour travel to get just basic hair stuff. Can I just take this store, like, and just buy it and bring it? No? Okay, well, I also don't want to stay here with all of this colonial white, so I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna cry a little bit, take a few of these products back. <laughs> um, I have kind of two half questions and you guys can pick one or none or both. Um, does uh-huh. a refugee ever stop being a refugee? And is it important, Ooh. is that is that a, a label or identity even important? Um, I ask this because technically I am a refugee from Bosnia, yet saying that almost feels like it's like, disingenuous because I'm not in the position of a refugee any longer. So what is the lifespan of a refugee? Does that identity ever change? And then to piggyback on that, the feeling of being in between, which was a common theme throughout all three of the videos we watched tonight, that's something I've grappled with a lot, where I belong. Is it America? Is it Bosnia? Is is it the in-between? Why is that important? Like, why does that really like get under our skin so much? Is it important? Why should it be? What like what? How can you, how do you rationalize that? So the question is two parts. The <laughs> guys, I'm trying to be serious here, right? I told my mother I wouldn't embarrass her. The question is two parts. Uh, the first part is what is the shelf life or lifespan of the term refugee? Does it follow you for the rest of your life? And the second part of the question is. Um, I, I'm going to try to condense this in what I think it is, so please correct me if I'm wrong. The second part of the question is, is, is it important to identify as a refugee, and why does it get under our skin? Not uh, so or much the identity as a refugee, but just that feeling of being in between is oh. impactful, and it, you yeah. feel it, well, why, why, does it, why should it matter? Why, does why it should matter? the feeling of being in between two spaces matter? And Can why does it hold so much that? weight? Can I take that? Yeah? I read the question. I'm trying to... <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. I think it's a personal choice, obviously. But uh, what I can tell you about that is that it gave me extreme freedom in my life. It, uh, it, it has, uh, of course, the good parts and the bad parts. The good parts are that I don't have to belong to any, any group of people. Uh, I can be an outsider. I can look at them and judge them. Uh, I, I've been in many countries, and each one of them told me that they are the best. So obviously, I don't believe and I don't trust any of those countries. Uh, I take my house with me wherever I go. And, uh, you know, plus I think that this uh, feeling of I want to go home is not something that only happens to refugees. It happens to all of us. This is a universal feeling. Um, There is something in us that is a void that we are always trying to fill with things. And uh, we call, it's kind of like a nostalgia kind of feeling, you know, with that you are not settled, you are not in your right place, you are not, y- you didn't find what you're looking for, something else is better than what you fa- what you have. I, I put all those things in this bag, you know, of, so, yes, of course, I have, I, first of all, I am not a refugee, but uh, I'm kind of like a refugee. Um, so I, I think it's not that uh, a clear cut, you know. The fact that you come from uh, Topeka, Kansas, might make you kind of a refugee as well many times. 
And uh, also, you know, I mean, this tremendous advantage of, you know, the, you don't have to be an idiot and go out there and scream USA, USA. You know, you just, you don't belong in that category. That's great, you know, it's, it's an advantage. Uh, that's what I wanted to say, anyway. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if it's if this feeling of of not belonging to one place or another is something that we choose to keep or carry, as much as it's something that we're reminded of, right? We, it isn't that I go through my day saying, "Oh, I choose to not belong here." It's someone will ultimately remind me that I don't belong. And and then you know to to be speaking to you in English to be using this vernacular means that I have engaged in a kind of betrayal to my own language, that I have engaged in a kind of abandonment of my own mother who doesn't speak this language, right? And so to inhabit one place means that you can't inhabit the other place, at least not at the same time. And so the, there is sort of both a very real physical dislocation uh, that happens through language, through culture, through migration, uh, that also sort of happens psychically and me metaphorically. And, and I think it's that experience of displacement, that experience of not belonging fully to one place or to, uh, to the other, that isn't necessarily chosen by us. It is, it is sort of a, a condition of, of displacement. And, and so I, I don't think of it as a choice. I, th I think sometimes you can, you can choose to dismiss it. You can choose to, to not give it a certain amount of weight, but, but the experience is there and it's, it's not necessarily of your own making. Um, so to answer the first part of your question, I don't think there's a shelf life on it. I think it's your entire life. Um, and it will forever be your life. And it is something that I feel like can be passed down through generations. It's a generational thing. Um, I, I, I view it as much as I do view my own blackness. I'm not going to wake up one day and not be black anymore. Um, it's just not how that works. Um, and I think that, in essence, the idea of this having kind of your foot in two places it's it's kind of weird in a way. Um, I guess in my experience, uh, being a refugee just to kind of separate it from folks who are uh, who have immigrated here on a non-refugee status or non-asylum status. Um, I think kind of opened my eyes to having a lot more in common with folks that I wouldn't think of to have in common before. And I remember. Um, when, you know, by working on the Capitol, uh, someone had asked me, at the time I had taken on the role of doing the policy advising for issues on immigration. Um, and, you know, just handpicked a few uh, that I was going to personally research, give briefings on, and yeah. And folks are kind of surprised and they're just like, okay, you're picking all of the immigration stuff that deal with undocumented immigrants. Well, why is that? And I was like, they're refugees. They're not undocumented. Anywhere else in the world, you leave one country and you go into another, you're considered a refugee. Only in America, if you leave your country and come in here without paperwork, you're considered undocumented, as if that's something different. Like, my parents walked into Zambia with no paperwork. <laughs> it's just lucky enough for them that Zambia is in a position in the world where they're forced to treat my family and the, those families as refugees and can't necessarily just turn around and expel them. <laughs> There's a whole space for them to live, a whole process in place to, you know, it's not perfect, but there's a process in place that kind of makes a space for them, regardless of how that space may be reflected to where in the United States, it's not the case. And I, I do feel like the words that we use are very powerful in meaning. And I find myself, even to this day, I don't, don't care to say undocumented. I just call folks refugees. 
because that's what they are, in my opinion. There's no difference from what those families did and what my family did. It's just that we did it in different countries. Um, and for me, in the sense of having a foot in each door, I feel like I, I harbor this space that's not necessarily in one place or the other. I don't really feel like I have one foot on each side. I kind of feel like I'm in the middle of parallel railroad tracks. I'm not on one, I'm not on the other, I'm not on both, I'm smack there in this in-between space. And at different points in my life, I feel closer to one side than the other. And even day by day, I can just flip-flop where I'm around. And um, it's definitely very interesting because there is also this kinship, I feel, with the African-American community here in the United States. Uh, just because a lot of my friends were African American, I grew kind of immersed in that culture as much as my own. <laughs> and uh, it, it feels just as much as home when I'm in a place called Stupid Burger, where majority of the patrons are African American, as much as it does when I'm at my own house with my parents, where there's a different language being spoken. And so I don't really feel like there's a, a, a shelf life on it. I think it's a a whole life thing, but I do think that it's something that each individual has to wrestle with. And I feel like for me, I didn't find inner peace until I fully accepted at a, um, what do they call it? At an internalized level that there was no either or, and there was no and, but just an is and a be. And so I just had to learn how to be. Um, and with learning how to be, I became okay with that, that I didn't need to be a refugee. I didn't need to be an American. I just needed to exist because existing in and of itself is hard enough. <laughs> I would just say that having been married to a refugee for 15 years, um, it's what I've seen in him is um, refugee, is less of an identity than how he responds in the world. And by that I mean that after traveling through 17 countries and getting deported from most of them after having survived in you know, war-torn country, um, adapting many times as he had in his own life, that the fight or flight reflex is so strong in him that he doesn't feel comfortable when things are calm. There's the sense that refuge never actually comes and that it's, um, it's almost like he, if there isn't a crisis, he'll create one because that's where he feels comfortable. That's what he's used to. So Sharif, I'm gonna repeat it so that people can hear. Um, it's that uh, for someone who has been through a civil war and has been a refugee, that this moment feels very similar um, and is bringing up a lot of trauma for people. Yes. Yes. It was actually kind of funny because I remember that after the election, uh, I had a lot of friends kind of wondering and talking and speaking, and I kind of finally just put into words what I was feeling at the moment because it was kind of strange. And it was just essentially I had taken to Facebook and I saw one of Alberto's posts, and that's what kind of helped me put it to words because he is way better at words than I am. I am unless it's profanity, I'm not really that great <laughs> <laughs> um, And it just is a sensation that I was like, this is that moment. And as soon as I said that out loud, I get a phone call from my parents. And I knew it was serious because usually my mom calls and then hours later my dad will call on his cell phone. But the fact that it was a phone call from the house phone, I pick up and both of their voices say hello. And I'm like, damn it, they got two phones. Um, this is real. And they just said it to the phone, we told you, this is the moment the war is going to start. This is the <laughs> moment. And I was like, oh dear God, not the war again. Um, for those uh, that also have grown up in a similar situation where your home country has been real civil war, your parents constantly make you feel like a civil war is about to happen any day in America. Just because we're in America doesn't mean it's not gonna happen. 9-11 was that moment. Um, <laughs> any moment where there seems to be adversity. And so when that happened, my dad's like, the war is gonna break out. And you're going to see the true face of this country. This country that wants you to think it's home is going to turn their back. And you're going to be sent on the same plane that we are, if it is a plane, <laughs> or in the same cell that we are, 
and you're gonna see your country for what it is, or this country for what it is, and this feeling that at any moment, a war could break out. And even to this day, my, my dad will still be like, did you hear about this shooting at this place? Did you hear about this mass incarceration over here? Did you hear about this? This is the start of a war. And it's that kind of weird feeling that I'm so comfortable with that idea of like, oh, that's right, the war could start tomorrow. Yeah, I've been hearing that since I was a kid. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is true. In moments of peace, it is just the weirdest thing. I can't be in my house and it's quiet. I have to turn on the music. My, I like make my dog bark. I'm like, no, no, I need the noise. I need the chaos because I know how to deal with chaos. I don't know how to deal with this peace and quiet. <laughs> it's eerie. It's ominous. There's a, I don't know how many of you know, but there's a growing field called epigenetics. How many of you have heard of epigenetics? So epigenetics is basically the, uh, the study of how trauma, among other things, leaves genetic markers on our very DNA. And uh, you remind me of that because you literally are carrying around the genetic marker of your grandfather's, of your father's war in you. And, and uh, I'm carrying forward some genetic marker related to whatever trauma my grandmother went through when she uh, was carrying my mother's ovum, right? And so all of us, including Casey, carry some kind of genetic marker that, that predisposes us or, or prepares us or disadvantages us to that world of peace <laughs> uh, and, and has somebody like Casey or somebody like me constantly on edge. Uh, bec because of that real sort of lived PTSD, uh, that stands for post uh, Trump <laughs> traumatic <laughs> stress disorder. <laughs> and I, it's not quite post, but yeah. Uh, and so it's very real. Uh, and science is now catching up with, with sort of a kind of understanding that our communities I uh, have known for a long time and, and uh, that our mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers have always talked about the importance of making sure that when a woman is pregnant uh, that we make sure that she feels safe, that, that she doesn't have to worry, that there's no stress, that she uh, is, is uh, fed, that she's clothed, all those things because we, we know, we have always known that if she is not taken care of, that that'll affect the, the baby. And the science is now catching up to a kind of generational wisdom that our communities have known about for a long time. Yeah. You, you probably want to go home, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I want to go it's home. Awesome. Thank you for coming. I watched the rest of them. Watch the rest of them. Yeah.